Hi there, my name is Keith Bergun. I'm a game designer and I do a bunch of writing about games and I have this functional theory for game design that I wanted to talk to you guys about today and sort of clarify it in a new kind of way. Um, I'm a writer for a, a lot of uh, game design blogs and things like that and uh, I've also recently uh, written this book called Game Design Theory, A New Philosophy for Understanding Games. And uh, in trying to explain this to people, um, I've taken uh take taken a few different approaches and and this this is my latest approach right here to explaining how this can be useful for people this this way of looking at games um so first let's start with my goal my goal is to establish guidelines to help designers create better games so when i say guidelines it's good to uh point out that i i don't mean rules i don't mean like hard fixed rules laws i mean uh generally we can use these guidelines to uh, make better decisions about game design. And I'll be more clear about what I mean by better later on. Basically, it's important to know that these are, this is first of all, this, we want to establish guidelines. So we want to establish some sort of soft rules that work most of the time uh, that, that uh, p people can learn in order to create better things. So that's, that's my goal. I also think it's uh, good to start with a problem statement and to say, ask this question, what if we are building a castle on a swamp? So what if like we've had this, you know, 20, 30 years of, of game design that's been happening and it's, uh, maybe we started on bad footing. Maybe when we started building this castle, meaning this great uh, structure of, uh, of game design philosophy, Right now we have a bunch of sort of rules that have kind of come about or sort of emerged in throughout uh, our our time as game designers in the last that's again that's the last 30 30 40 years at the most um, and we've started to develop a bunch of like habits and uh, expected normal ways of thinking about games and what if the the way we started thinking about those was flawed in, in the very beginning what um how how would we improve on that? How would we fix that? And now this is a big reason, I think, why one of the reasons why I, I've run into mixed reactions on my book and my theory is that the answer sometimes requires some destruction. Sometimes the answer is to actually sort of start over. And so a lot of people uh, get very upset that I'm, you know, I'm throwing out a lot of work. I'm 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 saying maybe we need to just like kind of start over looked at it from a new angle and uh again i'm not i'm not trying to say that this is the only way to look at games or that this is the you know the absolute certain correct answer to game design i'm saying this is a way that we can look at it and this is the way that i think that we should look at it but uh you know uh I i'll explain why i think that um it's worthwhile to kind of ask ourselves what if the way that we think about video games is seriously flawed? Like, if you believe that, where would you go from there? So, you know, I think it's just good as a sort of way of thinking, like, because it's a lot of, it's difficult to kind of get into that mindset, I think, uh, with certain things. What if, what if, uh, you know, the, the, the norms that we've always been told, what if, you know, I remember I, I grew up in the, you know, in the 1990s being told that like, you know, Zelda and Mario and Final Fantasy and Metal Gear, Metal Gear Solid. These were like the pinnacles of game design that we, you know, these are just the best games of all time. And uh, a lot of people still call them that. And, you know, uh, what if the structures upon which those were built had flaws, had serious flaws? Um, what would we do if we were, if I was able to convince you of that, what would we have to do from there? Um, so it's also, it's worth noting just that how short, uh, we've had, the, I've, I've titled this panel, the rise of digital gaming, but really, I mean, since it's only been the last 50 years that, that 40, 50 years that, that games have been a real commodity where there's been a real serious demand for new games. Um, you know, for most of, there's always been games, of course, um, since the beginning of civilization, but there haven't been a demand for like new games every year. Like, every, you know, every month we need like 20, 30 new games for a hundred new games. Um, and so because there wasn't that demand, there wasn't, you know, a type of person that is a game designer that, that really is a new thing that just started in the 20th century. 
in the latter half of the 20th century. So did, it started largely with digital games. I mean, digital games really, I mean, there were board games, of course, there were war games, they were, but they were largely hobbyist things. And the things that weren't hobbyists, like things like Monopoly, things like Risk, um, there were, you know, there's only like 10 or 20 of those that, that, that reach any kind of serious, uh, like proliferation. And there wasn't a huge industry of making board games before, you know, like before this same period where digital gaming took off. And there's a lot of reasons, cultural, historical, economic reasons for why this is. But either way, <clears throat> when we look at the rise of digital gaming, starting in like the early 70s, picking up intensely throughout the decade, crashing in 77, coming back again in 78, crashing again in 83. So by 2007, we have, we have this massive industry, 9.5 billion, and then 25 billion in 2010. That's from an ESA annual report um, from 2010. So it's just this massive industry. It's like bigger than, I believe it's bigger than, you know, film and music and it's just huge. And so it's exploded within these last 30 years, 40 years. And, uh, and so that's, that's kind of interesting that we have that like incredible, I mean, that's not news to anyone. Everyone knows that that's what happened, but it's worthwhile to point that out when, tr when I'm trying to paint this picture that you know, maybe we got off on the wrong foot. Um, so what, what is game design? What does the word mean? Uh, we don't really have a clear established answer. And this is something that most people agree on. I watch a lot of these kinds of presentations and, you know, most, most of them have a panel that looks a little bit like this, that except, uh, what my thing is, I don't think we've had that much time to ask this question. So I think it's actually understandable that we don't really know what game design is. And a big difference between me and a lot of other people is that I think we can figure out what game design is. We can come up with a solid answer for what game design is. Um, but we haven't really had that much time yet. So when we don't know what game design is, but there's this huge demand for games and interactive entertainment in general, what do we do? I mean, we, people don't just turn down that opportunity. Where there's opportunity, we, we go for it and we start making things. So what do we do? Well, the first thing we do is something called fantasy simulation. This is a very easy thing to, for everyone to understand. We all understand it sort of innately as children. And, you know, uh, the idea of pretend, the idea of being in a different world. Um, on the right here, we have a very new game, uh, Skyward Sword from the Legend of Zelda series. On the left, we have uh, Ultima. Um, I think that's Ultima 1. It might be Ultima 2. I forget. Um but it's very early at Ultima. And the point is that uh, it's not a, this is not like, has nothing to do with recent or technology. Fantasy simulation can be done on any level of technology. In fact, there's pen and paper games that are totally about uh, fan fantasy simulation. Th this is a very easy goal to understand, like for a design goal. You know, I want to make a world, it's a simulated fantasy world um, where I can fly around on a dinosaur bird or I can walk around and fight monsters and adventure, you know, the, the, and, and if you look at, uh, this is something we see a lot in video games throughout the entire history of them, um, is to simulate this fantasy. So that's, that's one, that's one design goal that was sort of assumed that sort of, um, started us off right in the beginning. The other one being technological spectacle. Um, again, th this is another very easy to understand goal. Um, uh, on the left, we have a uh, mortal Kombat, which a lot of people might think is kind of a weird example of a technological spectacle now, but actually at the time it wasn't, I mean, it, it, a large part of its selling point. I mean, everyone knows the selling point was the blood and the fatalities, but another selling point was the fact that it had these digitized photographs for the, um, in-game pixel art or sprites. Um, that was something that really hadn't been in many games before, if any games before. And so that was a sort of spectacle. That was this sort of, um, selling point. Other than that, it was really not a terribly new, uh, kind of design. Um, but that made it this special thing. And so again, that, and, and then on the right, we have, uh, the power glove, of course, um, which again is, it seems like this really cool thing. It makes you sort of look like you're from the future or something. Um, these are both examples of technological spectacle. Uh, and the power glove is actually quite similar in technology to the Wiimote. So, you know, and then today we have, you know, all kinds of, um, you know, touch screens and uh, motion devices and uh, various different uh, inter interfaces that 
really come down to a kind of like spectacle, like, ooh, look how cool that is. And what I want to make clear is that stuff is cool. Technolo technology, new technology actually is really cool. Um, and it's easy to, it's obviously very easy to understand why it's cool. And so this was one of the things that we started doing was having video games be this place where we can say, look how cool this tech is. Um, but in, again, is that really game design? Um, I would say it's not. And uh, yet this, this was one of the major pillars from, from the very, very beginning until just today still. This is still one of the pillars. Fantasy simulation and technological spectacle have been pretty much the pillars of, of our game design goals. And I, I think that's kind of a problem because um, these these are not these aren't related to game design specifically. You can you can simulate fantasy. I think that games are something different than just these two things. Um, and I think most people agree with that actually. Uh, but uh, so my my approach from here is to start very low and uh, establish try to establish forms. Okay, so we can't really establish any useful constructive guidelines without first establishing forms. The term video games is, is very broad. Uh, it basically means digital interactive entertainment. Um, and that, because that's so broad, you know, again, my, my goal is to create guidelines, right? And that's what I want to help do to help other designers and as well as myself. So if I want to create guidelines, well, what should or shouldn't you do when creating a video game? Uh, th this is an extremely difficult question to answer. And I think that this is, this really is the reason that we don't have strong guidelines already built because there's a lot of people thinking about these problems. So, you know, I'm not the only person, obviously even, I'm not even close to the only person thinking about these kinds of problems, but we don't have, um, sort of a, any kind of like proposed, you should do this. You shouldn't do this, um, in, for game design. And I think this is a large reason. How can you make a general statement about what you should or shouldn't do when you're what you're addressing is this giant category of digital interactive entertainment that, you know, encompasses so many different types of systems from, you know, MMOs and stuff like Minecraft and stuff like Starcraft and stuff like Super Mario Brothers and Tetris and just these vastly different system types. And so um, it, it makes sense to kind of like look at a low level and try to find forms. That's that's my approach. So the first step is to uh, realize that uh, interactive systems are engines that produce a certain kind of experience. And we need to find out what those experiences are. Um, they're engines that take input from the player. Um, they, they, in, they, they process your input and they give you some kind of experience in return. Um, once we know what these kinds of experiences are, then we can refer to those different experience types as forms. Um, I'll get a little more into that in a second, but forms are not mediums. Uh, so, you know, the medium is the stuff that you put your ideas onto. So, you know, the medium for a painter might be a canvas. The medium for a digital interactive entertainment creator is probably a computer. Um, so forms are not mediums. That's a good point to make. Uh, forms are also not genres. Um, genres generally refer to like a style of of making something and usually they're within forms so in the form of poetry you have several different kinds of genres different types of genres in the form of film you have you know fame famous genres like romantic comedies and action films and and uh and things like that those are genres they're sort of um like a set of uh con like style tropes that that establish a style so but forms are not the same thing as genres um, and so we have to find the essential properties of these engines in order to find these forms. Uh, and by essential properties, I mean the properties that make those, uh, uh, systems special, those engines special, um, that, that give them their identity. So in order to do this, I need to create prescriptive definitions. So here's the disclaimer about that. We're going to need words to refer, refer to these forms. I've chosen to use existing words that are already very close to having the meanings we require. Some of them are totally have the meanings that we require. Some of them mostly have the meanings that we require. Some of them have contentious meanings in certain groups. And a lot of, and some of the people watching this are going to find 
some of the my words uh, abrasive. One in particular, which we'll get back into in a minute. Uh, these definitions, however, are not meant to override everyday layman definitions. They are prescribed by my lens for the purpose of greater utility. And this is something that you see happen in in all kinds of uh, in all kinds of disciplines. Uh, you know, in 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 th there there are terms that use everyday words to mean very specific things in a specialized craft. And so this is really actually not that unusual, and it helps us to be more clear about what we mean. Because again, I think a big problem is just a lack of clarity in our language in how we are actually referring to the kinds of things that we want to make. So now we can get into the forms. What are they? Well, the first form is called the bare interactive system. You can also call it a toy. It's often called a sandbox or sometimes a simulation. Um, but yeah, think of it as a toy or a sandbox. These are engines that lack goals. They rely heavily on, on loose play and a lack of structure. A lot of times, uh, a good bear interactive system allows for emergent um, other systems to form uh, in a sort of spontaneous way. So the looser they are, the more sort of ingredients they have for dynamicism and uh, less elasticity, um, the, the better toys the things tend to make. Um, I like the word toy just because it's a shorter term than bare interactive system, but basically it's just a bare, it's an interactive system that just, you can put input in and that you will get some kind of output out, but it doesn't have a goal. That's a really, uh, very clear identifying quality to the bare interactive system. And some examples of this are Minecraft on the left, Microsoft Flight Simulator in the middle, and Gary's Mod on the right. And these are all things that, um don't have goals. A lot of times people will make goals up for them or in flight simulator, for example, this is a good point to make really quick. Um, flight simulator is both the name of, it is the name of an application. Actually, um, the, there, there's the normal free flight mode in most flight simulators. And that's what I'm really referring to is that system. That's the toy because in, in flight simulators, they also tend to have, uh, inside of them, they have, uh, scenarios. And these scenarios actually would not qualify as a toy because they have a goal and you can win or lose them. So um, I'm not that that's another good thing to make is this distinction between software and the system. Um, and uh, so, yeah, uh, flight simulator, the the free flight mode is a toy. Um, so it, but if you have any kind of like goals applied or like special goal modes inside of these softwares. Uh, those are a different kind of system, one of the ones that we're about to get into. So the second form is the puzzle. Puzzles are the previous system, the toy, plus a goal or solution. Now, unlike toy, our definition for puzzle differs from the norm. Now, the, the, norm, the normal definition for puzzle, particularly in the video game arena, is extremely confusing and inconsistent and really problematic. Um, uh, for example, we, we, we call things like, um, well, I'll get back into that. Actually, I, I should go into the last, the final four, but, but our basic, our definition for puzzle is, is kind of bad right now. Um, which again, I'm not saying that we can't use it in colloquial, you know, settings, but for, for our design purposes, it helps to be really clear. And the way we use the word puzzle is not clear. So anyway, um, that aside, unlike toy, our definition for puzzle dif differs from the norm. Um, uh, because puzzles are literally just the previous system, the bare interactive system, plus a solution or goal. Now, puzzles don't have to be difficult, but maybe good puzzles do. Um, so that's a distinction to make. A lot of people tend to think, oh, puzzles have to be hard, but they really don't. If the, if I say, um, okay, here is a square hole, please place this, uh, square peg into the square hole. That's technically a puzzle by my prescriptive definition. Now that doesn't, that, that's j just, we're being extremely very low level. So there are going to be things like that, 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 um, qualify as some of these things that are going to seem strange, but it's, it's just, it's because we're being as low level and as clear as we possibly can with these words. Um, so, so uh, some examples, we have the classic box moving game, Adventure of Lolo, um, and Portal, of course, and Professor Layton. Um, it's also worth noting that uh, all of these games, all of these uh, apps, I, I, I like to use the word apps sometimes to refer to the actual application. Uh, Portal, 
being an application that has within it many puzzles. Um, each level is usually one puzzle. You could also say that the, the entire game is one great puzzle. Um, the solution to which is to solve all of the puzzles within. Um, so that's just a little quick little um, side note. But anyway, on to the next system. Uh, the important point here, though, was to say that uh, puzzles are the previous system, the toy, plus a goal or solution. Form number three, the contest. Contests are the previous system plus competition. So now we've got a toy plus a solution, and now we are adding competition. Um, this is actually the least controversial definition of all of them, maybe. Um, because I, don't, I just don't think, I, I haven't heard anybody ever uh, complain about this one. Uh, good contests provide a clear measurement of some ability, some raw ability. So uh, on the left, we have DDR, which, uh, which is, is measuring both your dexterity and also your muscle memory and just your actual, you know, how, much, how well have you memorized these? Um, if you and I are going to play against each other, it's largely going to be a test of who has memorized them better and who has better dexterity. So we're getting a measurement of those, of those things. Uh, in the middle, we have darts, which is not a video game, but it's a good example. Another one, there's a quite a few sports actually, or sportish physical games like um, horseshoes and uh, bowling, which are contests. Um, they, they just simply, they have a, uh, usually an obvious goal and it's a matter of who can do that goal better. On the bottom right, we have a really cool old Technos game called uh, Crash and the Boys. And this was one of the mini modes inside of it, um, which uh, was called the hammer throw. And it was just a button mash. You have to pre mash the A button as fast as you can. And then I think mash B, press B when it's the m meter goes really high and your guy throws the hammer and you're trying to out throw the other guy. Um, some ex real other real life examples, like a, a sprint would probably be a contest. A javelin throw would also be a contest. Um, and that it'll become more clear what is and isn't a contest when we get to the last form, form number four, which is the game. Again, games are the previous system, the contest, plus decision making. So decision making. Um, this is the most controversial definition. Um, it's less so with board gamers. It's more so with video gamers. Um, because video game players are very used to using the word game to refer to all interactive entertainment. Um, and uh, I'll have another word about that in a second, but good games provide the player with difficult and interesting decisions. Um, so decision making, uh, I'll, I'll get into that a bit. Um, but one of the, this is probably one of the most uh, contentious things about my lens and probably largely accounts for a lot of the problems that people encounter when they read my work. Um, the word, this, this is, again, this is a prescriptive definition um, to be as clear as we can about different types of forms. This is not a value judgment at all. I'm not, none of these forms are better than any of the other forms. If your favorite software by my lens's definition is technically not what we would call a game, that's not a slight against it. Um, it it can be a fantastic thing, and be not a game. Can be a game, or it could be, or be not a game, or it can be awful and technically qualify as a game. Um, some examples: Super Smash Brothers. Generally, any fighting style thing is a game because it involves decision making. You know, should I jump? Should I throw my projectile? Should I charge at him? Should I block? The, these are all questions of should. That's a really good way to, uh, we're going to get more into decisions and what, what constitutes it, what specifically constitutes a decision. But, um, so super smash brothers on the left there. And then, uh, on the far right, we have uh, starcraft, which is a strategy game. Um, and you know, in that the decisions are like, should I build marauders or Marines or, well, this is starcraft one. That was a starcraft two example, but, um, you know, should I get, um, dragoons or zealots, you know, um, should I move my forces out now or should I expand? Uh, these are all questions of should. And, uh, and, and then in the middle we have Tetris and this is a great example. I, I mentioned earlier how, um, our word for puzzle is really awful in video games and really useless. Um, it's, you know, I can't say that it's wrong, but it's, it just doesn't have a lot of clear use. Um, and that's because it's really inconsistent. Uh, when you ask a lot of people what a puzzle is, they sometimes will think like they'll, they'll give you very vague 
um, answers like, oh, a game that makes you think or something. Um, and that's, of course, silly because, I mean, clearly StarCraft makes you think. Um, and I don't think anyone would call StarCraft a puzzle. Um, so Tetris, Tetris has a score, if you see right up there. And that's, that's kind of a telltale sign of a contest, especially a score that's not like, that's, that's, doesn't have a top, uh, a max. You know, the score can just go up into perpetuity, um, theoretically anyway. And so that's sort of a telltale sign that it's at least a contest. But actually, I, I, in my opinion, it's definitely a game because you have these choices about should I continue to build up or should I cash in now? And that depending on the architecture of your your like junk that you've been building up, that can be an ambiguous, difficult decision. Interesting decision. So Tetris is a game. I think people call it a puzzle because it has interlocking pieces that fit together a little bit in the way that a j uh, jigsaw puzzle pieces fit together and so that's again that's obviously kind of a silly reason to call it a uh, a puzzle so anyway we can see um how these line up now um interactive systems being bare interactive systems you know being on the outside there but they're all interactive systems and then when we get to puzzles the second level we add a solution when we get to contests we add competition and when we get to games we add decisions and so this for this is like my system for how I delineate what the forms are within digital inter interactive entertainment. So now the question is, what can we really do with this? How, how, how would this actually be useful? Now, whether or not you agree, I know that a lot of people are probably watching this and saying that they, they don't agree so far. Um, again, th these are, these are lang we're, we're basically talking about language uh, stuff. If you disagree with anything so far, it would be on the basis of language. Um, like, I don't agree that that should be called a game. And um, that's probably the most common complaint. So what I always say is, um, if you don't want to call it game, you can use a different word. You can use, um, you know, contests of ambiguous decisions. That's a, a long, chunky phrase. I use game because I think that's the best word in the English language to describe what I'm talking about. Um, but, you know, if you want to use a different word, that's okay. It's the concept that's important. So anyway, what, what can we do with this? Um, now we have a new definition for games. Um, it's a prescriptive def definition, a contest of decision-making. Now I sometimes say a contest of ambiguous decision-making. Um, and what I mean by that is, uh, uh, well, I'll, I'll get into that in a couple more panels, but uh, basically uh, when I say decision-making, not everyone agrees on what a decision is. So I have to be very clear about that. And uh, and I'm going to get more clear about that. Uh, in each of the aforementioned forms, the added element is the essential property, and it must be protected at all co costs. So um, whatever, whatever the new element is, for example, in contests, the new element is that competition, that measurement. And that must be really protected. If you're building a contest, you can't have something in there that's undermining that element. Um, that, that's one of the things that you really got to look out for. So um, what is the essential property of games? Well, a game is an engine that produces the experience of decision-making in the context of a contest, and therefore we must protect the decision-making. Um, so that's, that's so far what we've, we, we're, we're just sort of asserting. So now we're going to talk a little bit about decisions and why they're valuable and what they are. Um, all right, so executions and execution, rather, and decisions are different things. Execution addresses the can, and decision addresses the should. This is a big thing that like not everyone agrees with me on. I, I've had fights with some game designers about this. Um, I think that it, it, there's there is a difference between the conscious matter of uh, making a choice about something and the uh, physical ability to execute something or not. And that, that's really a distinction that I'll try to clarify more as we go on, and it should become more clear. Um, uh, well, let me get through this. Uh, a decision is necessarily ambiguous or uncertain. Otherwise, it's a false decision, which is not a decision at all. Um, uh, so ambiguous, what does that mean? Um, well, I like to say a decision lives between a guess and a solution. A guess being um, I in one of my hands is a coin 
and I, you have no other information but to know that in one of my two closed fists there is a coin and one of them doesn't have a coin and you have to choose now this is a choice but you have no information on which to make that choice so it's a total pure guess and by the by the uh, logic of my system that doesn't qualify as a decision because you have no information to go off of so that's not a decision by our system here um and and it so it lives between that and a solution a solution being you know the answer already you you so if i say there are coins in both of my hands choose one right um then you there's no you already know the solution is to just choose either hand. There's no, uh, there's no uh, uncertainty to it. And so that's also not a decision. So something in between those two is, is sort of what we're looking for. A decision must also be meaningful. Otherwise, it's a false decision. And, and part of that is um, some, some, sometimes, you know, you get um, decisions like, you know, uh, would you like a red hat or a blue hat? And it doesn't have any gameplay effect. And that would not qualify as a meaningful decision in the system in the game in, in the actual in in terms of discussing the game design um uh it may be meaningful in other you know it may be meaningful like in a personal way it may actually have meaning in terms of like i'm expressing myself i i, I, I like that i look like this character or whatever some kind of personal meaning but in terms of just pure raw system design it has no meaning it has no bearing on the system on the game so therefore it's not meaningful and so it's kind of a false decision and we see this a lot of the times uh, a lot of the time in in games where You'll have a couple of choices that, or things that seem like they're choices, but you it doesn't matter what you choose. You're just really choosing two flavors of winning. Um. So yeah, the the that's that's a little bit about what decisions are. Now, why why are decisions valuable? I, I, this is something I have been wanting to address. And essentially, human beings enjoy um, understanding understanding a system, and um, the the decision is a way for us to express our understanding um when we when there's a system that's very complicated and we're trying to sort of scale this mountain of understanding this system um we make a choice uh about you know where to move our pawn or whatever or where to move our our knight and in chess for example and uh the 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 way that we choose that actually expresses our decision making our, our our understanding of the system through decision making and then we get feedback from that system which uh which informs us of what our like how how much of an understanding we actually have so that's that's a really important thing that's kind of the engine that we talked about that a little bit about the engine before and the engine of the game is like we put in decisions and we get back feedback for what is our level of understanding? Um, another, another just quick little anecdote to make about decision making is what's really amazing about it um, is, and, and this is a good way to paint what I mean by ambiguous is you can make a move in chess and it can be looked on by others and yourself after the game as kind of like the winning move. That was the move that really won you that game. And yet, it can still not be the optimal move. There could have still have been an even better move. Um, and that, that uncertainty, that, that allows for ingenuity and creativity um, is really what I think makes games very special, a very special kind of system. So that's just a little bit about decisions and decision-making and how important that is to this kind of system. Again, if you don't want to call this kind of system game, you can use another word for that, and that's fine. Um, so anyway, from, from this position, we can now start to create guidelines for how to create better games. And by better, well, what do I mean? Um, I mean more focused. Because we're starting with a different... Remember, I said that we might be starting with a castle on a swamp, and we, our foundation was stuff like fantasy simulation, and technological spectacle, neither of which have anything to do with really interactive system design at all. Now, this is, this is a proposal for a new foundation from which we can actually create systems that are more elegant and more focused 
and without internal contradiction um, than we've ever been able to do before. And I'm going to get more into that in the next few panels. Um, what threatens decisions in modern video games? Things such as optimal choices, uh, false choices, they're false choices. Um, one example would be putting your starting workers on your minerals in StarCraft. Uh, that's something that's 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 a that's a false that's a great example of a false choice. Um, you just it's something you just have to do. Other examples would be running down a hallway, a long hallway, something like a fetch quest where you simply have to go and do this, you know, grab this jar and bring it to some lady or something. That's that's there's no choice to be made there. It's just a um, it's a matter of labor, which is my next thing: grinding or labor. Um, decision making is unnecessary or meaningless um, if specifically in systems where you have limitless grinding is allowed like Japanese RPGs or things like Diablo where you can just, I mean, there, there are challenges to overcome and there are some, you know, in Diablo, for example, or in Japanese RPGs, both of them have strategy game elements where, you know, you can equip your characters and you can use different magic spells that have different effects, etc. And some of them are like tactical effects and all that kind of stuff. And, and it seems like they're trying to create these, you know, games with these decisions and right. And, but the problem is there's grinding, there's infinite grinding. And so you can just, you don't, you can just skip all that. You can just level your guys up to level 99 and, you know, just I'd totally skip over the decision-making, um, and render that whole system kind of useless. And quick save is a similar uh, issue. You know, you're basically omnipotent. Um, and this is a really interesting thing. Like if you, if you're able to know what the effects of any, like if you have door number one and door number two, and you can see into both of those doors, uh, before you go, before you go through them and just compare which outcome is better. Um, that, that really is a decision killing thing. Um, it's, it's very similar to if we were playing chess and, you know, um, your opponent said, okay, but you have to let me undo any move. Uh, you have to let me like go back in steps if I don't like how things are going. That's really what quick save is. Um, so a choice really cannot survive in that atmosphere where, um, the player is allowed to see, um, different, different outcomes of his different choices. Um, some more things that, uh, threaten decisions. So these are, these are already, these are kind of guidelines that we're starting to be able to build here. Um, based on the fact, this idea that decisions are what's important in, in games. Um, excessive randomness, uh, fee, be, excessive randomness, things like, um, well, roguelikes and, and, uh, uh, you know, basically mostly any D and D influenced, uh, game is going to have a large amount of randomness. Um, and the problem with excessive randomness is that your feedback for your decisions is diminished because at the end of a match or the end of a game, um, of, of, whatever a roguelike for example you really have no way of knowing what feedback which feedback you can trust like if i did very well in a roguelike i can't um i can't be certain that the reason i did well wasn't because i just got good drops or there was uh easy monsters at the right times um things like that i i so that that's a problem with uh, excessive randomness is we can never tell if it was our agency, our decision making that we're getting feedback for, or if it was something else, something totally unrelated, just like dice rolls and random number generators. American board games tend to have this problem too. Um, you know, things like Arkham Horror and Talisman. Um, and uh, it's funny, they come from fan like strict fantasy simulators, which usually are toys. Um, but they, they, then they, they take a lot of those fantasy simulation sort of dice rolls for combat and all that kind of stuff, which works fine in the context of a fantasy simulation. Um, and then they, they turn it into a game. Another thing is descent. This, this, there's this, uh, game board game descent, which is basically D and D in game form. And it's very much like win or lose. And in fact, it's, com it's competitive between one player, one player is the bad guy controlling all the monsters. And then three or four players are controlling the D and D characters and it's heavily, heavily random. And yet, um, it's this sort of competitive thing and it's put, it's basically a game with a ton of randomness, dice rolls all over the place, card draws. And so at the, you really can't get 
trust the agency that you or sorry trust the feedback that you get for your decisions and that's a problem because that's that's a big reason why we play games is that engine that we talked about another thing is quite similar to excessive randomness is the excessive execution um again feedback for decisions can be diminished if a player can just overpower you with uh massive amounts of execution um so um one example of this would be RTS games where uh, you can know what the other player is going to do. Like let's say in Starcraft or Warcraft three is a, a fantastic example of this. Um, you can know what the other guy is going to do, like exactly what he's going to do. And you can prepare the counter. You can choose to get the correct counter for what he is going to um, get. So you've decided well, you've your all your decisions are good and you you've made the right decisions. Or, or at least strong decisions, if not the optimal ones. And yet you can still totally lose because of just pure execution on the part of your opponent. Um, a big issue with RTS games is that there's no cap at all on how many commands the player can put into the game in a given moment, in a second or a minute. There's no cap. So um, this, I mean, you, when you win or lose, you can't tell if it was because you made bad decisions or because you just didn't execute well enough so that's a good example of a kind of unfocused at a very very low level an unfocused um and and internally conflicting design fighting games tend to have this problem too um to not quite to such an extent because at least in fighting games when you do an, an action um your character usually has like a cooldown animation you know like ryu and street fighter he does a shoryuken and you know, there's like a second where you can't even control your character. So there is some kind of limitation to the execution. Um, however, they also have stuff like, you know, um, for example, uh, like, you know, complicated inputs and combos that you can just sort of memorize. And so if somebody just memorized those, you know, sets of combos, uh, they, that might uh, cause them to win, even if you have been making better uh, strategic decisions tactical decisions if you like um and uh okay so yeah those are some things that threaten uh decisions linear linearity um so if 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 your if your game is tied to an authored story and i have to use the word authored story because sometimes people say that oh well at the end of a game of tetris or chess you that's a story um and i think that's kind of a really um disingenuous way to use the word story because any activity that a human being undertakes is going to eat like result in an emergent story right like what what can you do that wouldn't result in an emergent story there's really nothing that you could do so we're specifically talking about an authored story a story that someone actually wrote it's a linear list of events now video games one of the one of the conventional wisdoms is that you you do. You tie your video game to an authored story. One downside of that is that, again, your your the effects of your decisions can only kind of be so much, so that they have to line up with. They always have, no matter what you do, it has to line up with this story, um, and that that tends to be kind of a problem. For example, um, we we tend to like make it so that players can't like lose halfway through because we really want them to experience the story um it doesn't really make sense for a, a, a player to have to get halfway through and then lose and then have to start at the beginning of the story like that's something that we've we've kind of rejected um largely um and so the issue there is you you know we shouldn't have this situation where the player can't lose that's not the answer, um, but that's 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 what we've been doing. We've been we've been going in the direction of well, the authored story is the most important thing because again, we don't have good fundamentals of under, understanding what it is we're even trying to do. We understand that stories are important to people, and so we're we're putting stories above the needs of the contest element of games, which is the winning and losing, the competition, and so we're saying okay, well, we can't have players have lose halfway through. So let's just, you know, let, let them basically be invincible. And between quick save and then even newer games like, um, for example, Kirby's Epic Yarn, I think you can't even die. They've just completely gotten rid of death. 
or if there is death, it's like something like in Diablo where you just sort of lose a little bit of gold and teleport a few, you know, uh, 30 meters away or whatever. Um, and so death doesn't really have a meaning. It's you, death is just this sort of thematic little slap on the wrist. It's not actually a, uh, there's no lose con there's no way to lose these things anymore. So, uh, that contest element is totally destroyed. Um, and again, that, that, that again, demi like just demolishes the, uh, the feedback that you get for your decisions. So, okay, that's all negative stuff. So how can we cultivate decision-making? How can we like, you know, actually make, uh, bring out what's great about decisions? Um, and then this is, this is, I should also mention that this is like the first, this is a very low level talk. Um, so we're not like getting super in depth. This is sort of a starting point. Like I said, it's, it's there's that castle on a swamp thing. So we're talking about the foundation of a castle here largely, but I'm just giving a few, um, sort of starting point, um, tips, I guess. So the first step is to choose a form, um, and to, and by focusing on the goal of a form or the, you know, the essential property of a form, we can achieve elegance. A, a really important thing to understand is that these forms, while they have a lot of, uh, similar components because of their, um, their, their essential quality, they can actually have conflicting goals that they do have conflicting goals. Uh, let's start on the right here. We have a uh, contest and game, right? They're adjacent to each other on my system. Um, now contest is about measuring and a game is about deciding uh, players decisions. Now let's take a, let's take a contest, a classical contest like, um, arm wrestling, right? Um, when, if, if you're doing professional arm wrestling and you're running a tournament, it's important that you make sure that players are not able to decide anything because you're trying to get an accurate reading of their arm strength. Now, if, if you have two people going against each other and one guy's like, oh, I'm, I'm going to, I have a strategy. I'm going to, um, like, I don't know, move my hand in a weird way or sit in a strange way or whatever. Um, the people running the tournament would hope, would try to identify those things and get rid of them. They don't want you to be making decisions. They want you to be making the exact, they want you just to be following the exact same rules as the other guy, not getting creative. And they just want to see who has the stronger arm. Um, in fact, decision-making in a contest can often be considered cheating. If not direct cheating, then sort of cheating in spirit. Um, you're not supposed to exercise creativity in a contest. You're supposed to um, measure your ability. Um, whereas obviously in a game, you're trying, we're trying to measure your decision making. We're trying to get feedback for your, specifically your strategy, your, your creativity, your ingenuity, your, your decision making. So if a raw measurement is overriding that, that's obviously a problem. Like I, I talked about in the StarCraft example which isn't always the case in StarCraft. And I'm not saying that that's like a, a damning quality, but it is a, it is something to consider. Um, um, a puzzle and contest for another example. Um, puzzles are about, uh, solve and contest is measure. So here's a good example. Bowling. You have two guys who both, they've both re they both found the solution to bowling and, uh, they, they, they've, they have bowling solved. They know how to, um, to get a strike every single time they throw the ball. So the contest in this situation is dead. It's been destroyed by the solution. So solutions are not good for contests. Um, you, you want uh, in a contest, and remember I mentioned that, you know, a telltale sign of a contest is you have a score that can never, there's no top. Well, one of the kind of scary things about bowling is that it does have a top. There is a max a score, I believe, that you can achieve. I don't know what it is offhand, but there is a max. And it is conceivable that there could be at least one guy, uh, if it hasn't already happened, um, who can get a strike every single time. And at that point, uh, the measurement is no longer taking place and the contest is kind of dead. Um, and so that, that's one example. So anyway, um, the, the, these, these, uh, different types of systems all have kind of conflicting, uh, conflicting, uh, goals. And, uh, so it's just something to be, familiar with and to worry about when you're this is the reason that you have to choose a form and you have to f you should focus on the goal of the form 
so that you can be have an elegant thing that doesn't have internal conf contradictions and conf conflicts. Um, another way we can cultivate decision making is by having unavoidable consequences, and this is kind of like the um, uh, uh, irreversible consequences. Might be an even better way to word that, um, but it's kind of like the the quick save thing. Um, there shouldn't, there's no such thing as optional consequences. That that's kind of a myth that we've been playing with in video games these days. Is well, if you want to take the consequences of your actions, then you can. If you don't want to, then you don't have to. The problem with that is, let's take quick save for example. Let's say let's say that you think quick save is too powerful and it does indeed undermine your decision making. Um, it does undermine the contest element of the game of the game. Um, then you can make a rule. You're basically making a house rule that says I will not use this thing. And then there, we're not even talking about the same game anymore. We're really once you change a rule, when you apply house rules to something, you've changed the nature of that game. You've you, it is a different game, um, especially from our our like the way we're talking about it. A game is a is really a set of rules. So if you change one of the rules, in the most formal sense, it is a different game. Whereas otherwise, if you use it, then you know you 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 use it. So there's no there's no um, there's no optional consequences. Uh, there's either consequences or there aren't consequences. Um, so it's very good to have consequences that, you know, you have this unique situation come up, you make a decision, you get feedback for you, how good your decision was, and you move on. And that, that situation, like, probably never shows itself ever again. Um, solution resistant. Um, contrast to puzzles, puzzles, of course, are designed to be solved, whereas games, games are, everything is theoretically solvable, games included. Um, they must be theoretically solvable yet practically unsolvable. So what we want is a, a game that, that has a solution that we can like build up towards. We don't want it to just be noise. We don't want it to just be random, you know. Um, it obviously has to have an order to it. And if it has an order and it, it works in a deterministic way, then, um, you know, cause and effect and all that, um, then it must be technically solvable, but we want it to be practically unsolvable. We want it to be the kind of thing that we're not going to find out and our, figure out the solution to in our lifetimes. And probably no human beings are going to in the next few hundred years. That's really, that's what I mean by solution resistant very resistant to solution. We can achieve that um, with complexity. Uh, that's, that's one really good way to do it, but specifically emergent complexity. Um, when you have a, a, a very clear core mechanism um, and, and maybe some supporting mechanisms um, and the, the game rules themselves, you've heard the old adage, difficult to, uh, easy to learn, difficult to master. That's, that's sort of the idea with emergent complexity. You have this thing and it seems very simple. Um, Go is an amazing example of emergent complexity. It's just so simple. You can explain the rules to Go in five minutes, and it takes you in a lifetime to become even like competent at it. When you when you when you turn the game on and you start playing and you start moving around in there, there's this all this complexity emerges, and you that's really the best way to make something solution resistant. Um, the other type of complexity is inherent complexity. And that's sort of just mass content. And that's something we're very familiar with in video games. Um, in board games, you see it sometimes in stuff like Magic the Gathering, trading card games, um, and to a lesser extent, the limited card games like Dominion and stuff. Uh, but basically, they, they are re content reliant. They re rely on a large amount of content to constantly be streaming into the system so to, to prevent the solution from being found. And, and constant, you know, changes and and new stuff. But the problem with that is there's, it's like, it's impossible to balance a, once you get to a certain amount of content and different little bits and elements and, you know, cards with a paragraph of text on them, it becomes practically impossible to balance those to the point where the solution will not be quickly found or, or at least dominant strategies that destroy most of the decision-making in the game. Um, You've probably heard the term dominant strategies before. That's 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 kind of like a soft solution. So this is a foundation for for thinking about games. Uh, this is just meant as a possible starting point. I know that 
a lot of people uh, will maybe not agree exactly on the way that I break down the current word video games. But what I hope people do is start to break that thing down on their own and break it out. If you don't agree with the way I've broken it down, break it down in your own way. The important thing is that we, we do need to start from a better foundation. We can't, the, the foundation that we have now is not workable. Um, that's really the big takeaway that I hope people get. Um, um, it's good to no- notice that, uh, that Euro games, European board games, um, over the past 20 years have experienced kind of a renaissance and a lot of them really seem to use something like my system. They, they seem to understand that decision-making is really this special thing that, um, and they've really been like kind of cultivating that. And I really recommend uh, looking into those if you haven't already. Um, and this can hopefully start us to build uh, from a foundation that's on solid ground. Um, uh, we have a really long way to go. Like I said, this is, it's really important to remember that this is a totally new discipline. And um, while there have been thinkers over the last 20, 20 years or something, we got to remember this is the beginning. If, if, you know, 100, 200, 500 years from now, we're going to look back on us right now and how we think about um, games the same way that uh, perhaps we thought about music of the 1600s or 1500s, pre-music theory. Um, much like music post-17th century, we can be the first generation to build games that are better, more focused. By better, I mean more focused, more uh, less internal conflict, conflicts and contradictions and more resonant than anything the world has ever seen. And I really think that that's true, that we, we in our lifetimes, we're going to see games that blow everything that we've seen so far just totally out of the water. And I'm really excited about that, and it's a great time to be a game designer. And so I hope that I've cleared some stuff up, and uh, you know, you can click on links below to read more about some of my stuff that I've written for Game of Sutra, or check out my book on Amazon. Uh, Thank you very much for listening to this presentation.